My name is Katherine Hayes. I'm the Director of Health Policy here at BPC. I'd like to welcome all of you to our first public event on the integration of clinical and mental health services. We're very fortunate today to have a great panel as well as a few special guests, um, one being Ben Miller, who is the Chief Strategy Officer for Wellbeing Trust, and very near and dear to our hearts, um, Nella Domenici, who is the daughter of the late Senator Pete Domenici. And for those of you who knew him, um, he was a tremendous advocate of mental health um, in, in the Senate and after he came to be a leader at the Bipartisan Policy Center. And we really miss seeing Senator Pete around here every day. But with that, I would like to um, introduce Ben Miller. And then Nella, if you will follow him for remarks after that. And then we will welcome a panel to the stage and get going today. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. So my name is Ben Miller. I work for the Wellbeing Trust. We are a national foundation committed to advancing the mental, social, spiritual health of the nation. And I want to start my remarks briefly with just a question. And I want you to think about this question because it actually will have a pretty significant impact on the discussion that you hear today. If you were in charge of redesigning healthcare, what would it look like and how would you ensure that mental health was a part of it? Yeah, easy question, right? Mm -hmm. Just think on that for a second. Because what we, in essence, are doing is trying to figure out new strategies for a new paradigm of health. The construct of health has been totally insufficient when we tease apart mental from physical and we talk about things as discrete categories instead of how people actually present, which is as a person who has health. One person every four minutes dies in this country from drug, alcohol, or suicide. One person every four minutes. 142,000 lives last year. My advisory board chair says that once you realize that something is not working, it is unethical to continue as if it is. I think we have an ethical, if not a moral dilemma on our hands, my friends. It's an issue of justice. It's an issue of race. It's an issue of equity. It's an issue that actually is much bigger than some of the things that we actually give it credit for. But rest assured, we will get there. It's gonna require all of us, each of us in this room, those of you that are in this room that represent various organizations or have leadership positions, it's on you to help us figure out how we can transform health to make sure that we get the mental health and substance use piece right. If we don't do this, unfortunately, I think we might continue to have wonderful panels like this for the foreseeable future. And as much as I love coming to events like this, guys, I think we've got to fix this now. So let me take you back to 1957, just for a second. 1957, there was a report released called the Folsom Report, and it highlighted a couple of things at once. One, it highlighted that many of the solutions that we're trying to solve are actually already in community. That community has risen up, held hands, and said, here's the things that we know work for us. That's number one. Number two, the other thing that the Folsom Report highlighted was that it's not just about health care. Now, that's easy to say in 2018, not just about healthcare, but truly, folks, we've got to think of ways that we can integrate the mental, the social, the spiritual, all of that together. That's why we do as a foundation what we do, because we understand that it's much more complex than just simply creating another clinic or another bed or another floor to your hospital. That health is the foundation for achievement, and if we're really going to truly try and help people achieve the goals that they have for their life, we have to fundamentally rethink that construct of health. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks for being a part of our dialogue today, and I will turn it over to Nella. Good morning, and thank morning. you all. Thank you all for coming. Um, I thought, uh, well, I just left a company where every time I gave a, gave a presentation, you had to go backwards before you went forward. And so I thought I would do that a little bit here at, a, at sort of a personal level and go backwards to 1975 when um, my family found out that my sister was seriously mentally ill. And that's when my father and my mother really began their journey on illness. 
And also, I w at that point, I was about 25, and I spent the next 10 years of my life very intensely involved in parallel with my parents on a multitude of mental illness-related activities. So my like historical vantage point from 1975 actually was, you know, um, very. It was un unacademic. It was very hands-on, but it was sort of very, very real at the same time. And so um, back then in 1975, when we found out that my sister was mentally ill, my parents sat us all down in a room and they told us, this is our cause, we're going to embrace it publicly. And it's not usually embraced it publicly, but we are going to use our brand to drive this cause forward. And we're not only going to help our sister, we're going to help the country and maybe the world. Um, but what I remember very, very clearly in 1975 was that the stigma around mental health was horrible. It's incomparable to what it is today. It was so taboo and so secretive and so humiliating and so embarrassing. Um, I also remember very clearly there was just too little money in research being spent. I remember I used to drive with my dad to work sometimes and he would talk about NIMH and how they don't have enough funding for this and how he was going to go fight for it and he'd come home and say, I'm going to get it. And I remember hosting events with NARSAD, the National Alliance on Research on Schizophrenia and De Depression. I was on the board and we hosted many events trying to raise money for research. And we were able to pull some of the big pharma companies in and some of the big device companies in, but it was a huge uphill battle. Um, similarly, I remember at a personal level with my own sister that the diagnostics around what does she have were very, very gray and very vague. And the treatments were blunt. And many of the side effects for the treatments were bigger than the mental illness problem in and of itself. And there was a randomness to it, a trial and error, a serendipity to it that's almost inconceivable in modern healthcare. And I remember my parents worried about the cost at their level for them, for us. And I remember my father saying, this is an illness that bankrupts families. I, I can remember them coming home and saying, oh my gosh, it costs 20,000 a month for this one and 9,000 a month for this one and $500 just for a 45 minute appointment even if you're 20 minutes late. And they were just torn by that, not, not only for themselves, but thinking about all the families that they knew could, could really suffer financial crisis because of the illness of one child in that family. So I constantly kind of look at those five threads, right? Stigma, research, diagnostics, treatments, and cost, and think, how are those five boulders being pushed up a hill? How are we getting better in all five of those areas? And when I step back today, obviously the stigma is much, much Reduced. We have people like Michael Phelps talking about depression. There's posters of him everywhere. Um, we have people like my father and mother who are welcome and happy to be open about it. Um, the money, the research is much, much higher from both the private sector and the public sector and the nonprofit sectors, a theme I want to keep, keep emphasizing. Diagnostics are still vague, honestly. There's a lot more precision. But it's nothing that there's, we shouldn't be settled with the level of precision. It's still very much trial and error. And the range of treatments has, ex has bloomed and blossomed, but the availability of those treatments is still very expensive and still not accessible to many, many people. And the cost is still high, but we do have insurance coverage now that is arguably equal for people with mental illness as well as physical illnesses. And that we can attribute to a very successful bipartisan effort by Senator Wellstone, Senator Kennedy, and my father. And I use that more as an example of a major thrust where a boulder got pushed way up a hill because people from different parties and different perspectives locked elbows and said, this isn't a partisan issue, this is really an American issue, and it's a global issue. Um, but despite all the success from that terrible starting point when I got introduced to this in 1975, despite the huge success, we still have 44 million Americans er every year who suffer from mental illness. 
for 44 million. We still have 16 million people who have at least one major depressive episode per year. 18% of people in America suffer from anxiety. So these are just huge numbers. Suicide has gone up 25% in the last 15 years. It hasn't gone down. A lot of that is attributed to mental illness. The cost of mental illness continues to be huge. Numbers like $200 billion in lost productivity due to cause issues like depression are out there. So we've pushed these boulders up a big hill, but there's still a long, long ways to go. And as we look ahead, I think one of the most important things is that we try to unite the Republicans and the Democrats and make sure this is not a political cause, a political problem or a political solution, and that we inspire the for-profit world and the innovators in the technology sector to come up with new and radically different and radically more affordable solutions, and that we work hard with the public sector to make sure there's funding, and that we continue to have our nonprofit sector with incredible, incredible organizations like NAMI fight stigma and help at the real grassroots community level, help in the community way that we just heard about earlier. So with that sort of positive and negative tone, we've come so far, but we have so far to go. I thank you all for coming, and I welcome you for offering your ideas and your energy and your openness.